Bird Note presents. I'm Ari Daniel, and this is Threatened. This is our last episode in Hawaii, where we've been examining the immense challenges that the birds here face and the people dedicated to making the island safe for them again. Today, we're looking at Hawaii's seabirds, specifically the Hawaiian petrel, or ua'u, a name that mimics its call. Ua'u are endangered. There are fewer than 18,000 remaining, and their behaviors make them difficult to detect, let alone protect. Historically, Ua'u used to breed at all elevations, but these days, due to impacts from coastal development and introduced predators, they nest in some of the most extreme places on the Hawaiian Islands. We're joining reporter Jesse Eden as she visits three remote outposts of nesting Ua'u in the Hawaiian Islands to find out how these little birds can cope, even thrive, in each place once we know they're there. We're starting in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park on Mauna Loa, the second tallest mountain in the islands. I wanted to go here because for decades, biologists have put in some serious work even to just find the birds that live here. And once they do that, they can advocate for measures to protect them. Wait a minute. Mauna Loa is an active volcano on the Big Island, right? So tell me, what's it like to be up there? Well, on Mauna Loa, there's this wonderful mosaic of old lava flows from the past centuries throughout the upper elevations. The Ua'u nest in small lava tubes and cracks and crevices up there. So basically, these tubes, you get flow of lava, and then as the lava cools, it pulls away and creates kind of a cavity. Exactly. These holes, called pukas in Hawaiian, are perfectly snug places to nest in. The Mauna Loa petrels nest at elevations of eight to 9,000 feet on the mountain. That's higher than Machu Picchu in the Andes of Peru. But unlike Machu Picchu, there are no roads leading there. The only way into this core nesting area is by helicopter. So wildlife biologists who study the Ua'u are flown up there. Then they set up camp for several days. The temperatures can go below freezing and you wake up with ice on your tent. Charlotte Forbes Perry is a wildlife biologist with the Pacific Cooperative Studies Unit and Volcanoes National Park. Charlotte has taken helicopter rides to these upper reaches of Mauna Loa countless times. But once we get here, I'm really happy to be here. It's so quiet sometimes I swear we could hear our our blood moving in our bodies. At night, if it's a clear night, you can see down to the Kilauea Crater. The stars are pretty darn amazing. You're just this little speck on these big open flows. On nights when Charlotte is gazing at the stars, Ua'u are on the move. They're busy flying to and from the ocean in darkness. In fact, Ua'u behavior is so mysterious that Charlotte has only seen a handful of Ua'u up close, even after studying them for the past 14 years. Waking up with ice on her tent for birds she almost never gets to see? This seems like a job with a lot of cost and not a lot of obvious reward. But Charlotte grew up here in the islands, and it's more than just a job for her. I think that my role in trying to take care of these birds, these uwa'u, is my contribution to my cultural upbringing. We believe these birds are our ancestors or, you know, family members. And we should do what we can to keep them as healthy as possible. This particular uwa'u colony here on Mauna Loa is fairly sparse. Currently, there are only about 80 known active petrel burrows that Charlotte regularly monitors. Monitoring these nest burrows helps us understand what's going on with the Ua'u population. Much of their life is spent on the open ocean. So during the breeding season, when they're on land, is when we really get to study them. Since Ua'u behavior on the mountain is so cryptic, motion-sensing cameras are vital to understand what's happening. Charlotte is setting one up outside a burrow. All right, so you're getting the batteries in there? Yeah. 
And this is one of those those nests that you sort of found off the cuff, right? Just cruising on by. Yeah, yeah. Just saw a bunch of poop and looked around and took us a couple tries and found the actual hole. The wildlife cameras that biologists use in the petrel colonies capture delightful images of the Uwa'u. You know, adults waddling to and from their burrows. And then later in the season, the chubby chicks all covered in their fluffy down feathers. But then there are also some difficult images to watch. So this is nest 226. We're watching a adult cat. You can see it's kind of right around the corner and pushing on something. And <gasps> oh my God. it has, it's coming out with a dead uwa'u. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh... Mm-hmm. At 9,000 feet. Mm-hmm. That is horrifying. Yeah. What happens for you when you see that you're expecting to see a bird? Oh, I'm I'm kind of talking really loud to myself in the office by myself, going, yeah. holy shit, fuck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's hard to watch. It's very hard to watch. Uh, yeah, there's just no good way to get rid of them except for the fence at this point. In 2016, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park did complete a cat-proof fence around a section of the Mauna Loa colony. They did this because of the work of Charlotte and her colleagues, who were able to show evidence of the burrows there. So they keep at it, searching and monitoring burrows to make clear the need for more fencing and protection for the other Uwa'u. We look for signs of activity when we're walking around out there on the lava. And one of the main things that we're looking for is Uwa'u poop. So when we see that on the lava, we look around that area for more like feathers, and then we'll look for the burrow opening, which could be a little cryptic at times. But then we also smell inside the area. Those are the main signs that we're looking for when we are looking for an active nest. Charlotte keeps her eyes and nose out for monitoring this relatively small colony. And I got to help her out with her work. Okay, so which burrow is this one? Uh, This is nest uh, 134. And it is big enough for us to crawl in. Or I guess I should say me. (laughs) Yeah, you. Because it's that way. It's this way. It's, yeah. Okay. It's a little tight. Yep, it looks a little tight, but lots of good poop. Yep. And uh, definitely looks active at this time. Yeah. And then you look to your right. Okay. There's a possibility of seeing the the adult at this point. Get the flashlight handy and yeah. sounds good. And you'll pull me out, yeah? Yes. I if will. I get stuck? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> I commend you, Jesse, for getting in there. It sounds pretty tight. Did you get claustrophobic? (laughs) Well, I'm not typically claustrophobic, but these lava flows can be pretty jagged. And so it catches on your clothing and stuff. And so sometimes as you're trying to move forward or backward, you're kind of getting stuck in there. It's nothing serious, though. I was able to maneuver my body and just squish in there. So what did you see? I didn't get to see a petrel, but the signs of activity were unmistakable. You know, poop outside the burrow, that strong, musty marine smell inside. Okay, so if the birds aren't at the nesting site, then where are they? So Uwa'u move back and forth, Malka to Makai, from evening to early mornings. Remember, they're flying to and from the mountain in darkness. Sorry, did you say Malka to Makai? Yeah, so Malka toward the mountain, Makai toward the ocean. And so they're out foraging out on the open ocean when they're not on the mountain. When their single chick has hatched, the parents take turns heading back out to the ocean to feed on squid and other seafood. Pairs work diligently alternating their foraging trips and staying on the mountain with the chick. And sometimes their foraging trips take them as far as the Aleutian Islands. Wow, up in Alaska? Yeah, those were birds that were tracked from Kauai. Now, I think it's believed that the ones here on Mauna Loa go as far as the waters off of Washington State. 
still pretty darn far. Of course, they don't always go that distance. Often they'll forage out to a few hundred miles offshore. But they've discovered that Ua'u occasionally make these enormous trips. Research with satellite transmitters tells us that sometimes they travel over 7,000 miles, the equivalent of traveling from, say, Seattle to Patagonia in South America. 7,000 miles. That's incredible, Jesse. So for a petrel to go from Hawaii up to Alaska in search of food, how long would that take them? Oh, that's a couple of weeks. Oh, man. So these birds are doing these weeks-long epic journeys to Alaska or Washington, and then they finally get home only to become dinner for a cat? Yeah, it's especially heartbreaking to see that happen after all that hard work. So Charlotte is working on getting more predator-proof fencing. But for now, she's grateful for the fence that she already has. Those cats can do so much damage. It's so nice monitoring, just knowing you're not going to find carcasses of um, while you're doing the monitoring because the, the fence has been working well in keeping the cats out. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, finally some good news. Jesse takes us to a very different environment where the Oahu are thriving. Unlike the modest Uwa'u colony on Mauna Loa, some of the other petrel colonies in the islands are remarkably robust. Wow, what do we have there? <laughs> that sounds fun. This is the Uwa'u colony on the little island of Lanai. Can you believe that for a hundred years we thought there were hardly any Uwa'u here? There are so many. Wow. I mean, it sounds so different from where we started on top of that volcano. Oh, yeah. Just a radically different environment from stark open lava flows at eight, 9,000 feet. Compared to Hawaii Island, Lanai is a tiny, relatively low-lying island. Its lush highland ridges reach to just over 3,000 feet. Often when people think of Lanai, they think of pineapples. Large-scale agriculture dominated this landscape for many decades. And because so much extractive land use has happened here, folks didn't really consider what a biological gem it could be. Lanai is unique in that it's only got about 3% of its original native forest left. Biologist Rachel Sprague is co-director of conservation for Pulama Lanai. But what's in that forest is still some of the highest density of nesting Uwa'u anywhere in the main Hawaiian Islands. If there's luhe ferns, there's petrels nesting in it still. Uwa'u here nest in tangles of green aluhe ferns. This chest-high thicket of these viny ferns undulates along the steep Lanai highlands. Having dug their burrows deep within these nearly impenetrable interwoven braids of green, nesting Uwa'u here are just as enigmatic as anywhere else. In fact, for nearly a century, the Uwa'u colony here was written off as barely there, nothing significant. In the early 1900s, there was a naturalist who wrote about them. And he said, oh, there's maybe 50 to 100 in the 70s, someone was doing a surveys for native birds and, again, said we found a few dozen to a few hundred, but the colonies probably seems to be pretty close to extinct. In the 1980s, referenced that study from the 70s and said uh, they still had found some birds likely nesting on Lanai, but they've got to be probably uh, extirpated by now. <laughs> But now there are actually estimated to be about 4,000 pairs of Uwa'u on Lanai. The island has very little development and just a few urban lights, so the darkness is perfect for these night-flying birds. In more urban settings, they can often become disoriented by bright lights and crash into power lines and other structures. Thankfully, that's not an issue here. But they do still face challenges. Rachel arrived on island in 2016 to begin Uwa'u studies here. At the end of that season, we found 
about 20% of the nests had succeeded. Four out of every five nests monitored that year had failed. Either the adults, the eggs, or the fluffy petrel chicks were eaten. Largely due to cats and rats. Mm. That was a big wake-up call. (laughs) And so we expanded cat control, we expanded rodent control. So they started trapping and killing the invasive predators, a difficult but necessary measure. And just the next year, we had over 70% nesting success. Now, five years later, it's sitting at about 80% nesting success, just with predator control. But trapping alone won't cut it. Ultimately, what they need in this colony is a fence, like on Mount Aloha. Money is typically the hesitation with fences. It's an expensive endeavor. But the team on Lanai is moving ahead. The predator-proof fence is under construction. When we deal with the introduced predators that attack these birds, the birds bounce back. But we can only protect the petrels if we know where they are. In addition to Mauna Loa, Lanai, and a few other places, another high elevation Hawaiian location was known for petrels, until it wasn't. That's Mauna Kea, the tallest mountain in the islands. It's here on the Big Island. Much of Mauna Kea's landscape has completely changed over the past couple hundred years with the introduction of cows and pigs and sheep and cats and rats and mongoose. I could go on. So biologists believed petrels had been totally eliminated from Mauna Kea since 1954. But with rediscoveries of seabirds in other areas of the state, biologists started to think that maybe Uwa'u could still be on Mauna Kea somewhere. In 2017, they began to search for them. That sounds a little different from what we heard before. Is that in Oahu? No, but it's one of the biologists who was part of this search. Brett Mossman is a wildlife biologist with Hawaii's Department of Land and Natural Resources. Remember how Charlotte used sight and smell to detect Oahu? Well, in this circumstance, Brett and his crew started their Uwa'u searches by using just sound. They deployed song meters around Mauna Kea's upper reaches. We had lab staff, interns, volunteers, were all working on this, you know, and so it took hundreds and hundreds of hours from dozens of people. The song meters record sound on the mountain. At various intervals throughout the season, the researchers retrieve their SD cards and analyze the recorded sounds. But some of the sounds from Mauna Kea's upper elevations, Brett and the team experienced in person. Yeah, so one of the first things that we found um, when we were looking for what up here was that we heard this like really like strange, almost laughter. It's like the best way that I could describe it, but it's like this breathy laugh. And it's in the middle of nowhere at like one o'clock in the morning on Mauna Kea. And it's like, oh boy. (laughs) It was like one of those chicken skin moments for sure. A year passed. And then one day, Brett was out working on the south side of Mauna Kea. Some of the team was on the mountain with him and some were in the office analyzing recordings. We were clear up at about 12,000 feet deploying song meters. And my coworker at the time called me and was like, we got them. And I was like, oh my God, like, it was just like unbelievable. And you're at high elevation, so you're already a little loopy. And I was just like, I just was so ecstatic to learn that we finally heard them. You know, so they like played the sound over the phone for me to hear. And it was just like, it was incredible. The confirmation of this first Uwa'u call was in 2018, and Brett's work only ramped up. Now they were looking for burrows, like I did with Charlotte on Mauna Loa. While I help him set up some rat traps, Brett tells me about tracking one Uwa'u. We went over and we were searching, searching, couldn't find the burrow, couldn't find the burrow, and so I was kind of like starting to lose hope, and I was like, dang it, we can't find it. As he was looking around, he saw a beautiful purple-blue flower. And then I was like, oh, there's a opelu, one of our beautiful lobeliad flowers that are so famous here in Hawaii for their adaptive radiation. First time I'd ever seen one in bloom. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. So I walked down to where it was, and I was like looking at it and taking pictures, and I looked over to my left and saw this little white thing 
I was like, oh, what's that? So I kind of like walked over to where it was and it was an eggshell. And so sure enough, right behind where that eggshell was, was the first Uwa'uburo that had ever been recorded on, in Kohala, in Western time. Kohala is in the remote northwest part of Hawaii Island. I was like focused on the plant and there was the burrow. And then same thing up here, we found this rare plant and then we found the burrow. And it was less than two meters from where that plant was. You know, so it's like, it's like, so for me, there's been this really cool thing where the plants have been showing me where the birds are. It took Brett and his team three years of searching to find the first burrow. But at some point, the team realized that they had detected Uwa'u way before all of this. Remember that creepy laugh they'd heard in the middle of the night? What we ended up finding out is that it was actually the Uwa'u flying by. So when they fly, their wings make this like wah, 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 sound. And so it was like we were all kind of creeped out and freaked out about what it was, but it ended up just being the birds we were looking for. <laughs> The hard work Brett and his team put into these discoveries has been critical in working toward getting protections that the Uwa'u need, which, no surprises here, is first and foremost a fence. We then were able to move forward extremely quickly to getting a fence constructed on Mauna Kea. So that ripple effect of finding this bird is now protecting this large 90-acre area that's going to be the only area in all of Mauna Kea that is restored to a state of almost being completely mammal-free. We're all connected. What happened in these islands is it changed too quickly for species to keep up. And I think that's where it becomes so important to bring in all aspects of island management and to really bring in these ideas of aloha aina, malama aina, kuleana to place, you know, responsibility, love of the land, and caring for the land. That's what needs to happen everywhere. This is where I'm happiest with these birds, and I sleep so much better when I know that my uwa'u is safe in its burrow. The work of studying these uwa'u is arduous. Their nesting locations are often extremely difficult to reach, and the terrain can be treacherous and exhausting. But it all matters. Back on Lanai, I sat with Rachel in the misty evening drizzle with our headlamps and rain jackets, overlooking the aluhe ferns where the uwa'u live. <laughs> Just being able to sit here and listen to them living their lives <laughs> and um, just walking up here knowing that, uh, that all of the other work that we've been putting effort into is making it so like this sort of amazing cacophony of birds can just do this and can just live their lives. Although Hawaiian petrel colonies throughout the islands are relegated to these high elevation slopes and the dangers to their well-being do persist, hope is high for their continued survival. When we mind the problems we've caused here in the islands, these resilient little seabirds can take care of the rest. Thank you for joining us for this season of Threatened in Hawaii. We've unpacked so much about this spray of islands in the middle of the Pacific and what they have to teach us about birds, the honey creepers, alala, uau, their habitats, and our unavoidable role in protecting it all. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be back in just a few weeks with more stories about people taking action for birds. We're heading to another island, Puerto Rico, for four more stories, and we'll be releasing them in English and Spanish. Stay tuned. This episode was produced by Jesse Eden and me, Ari Daniel. It was edited by Caitlin Pierce of the Rough Cut Collective, audio mix by Sam Johnson and Mark Bramhill, fact-checking by Connor Guerin. Our theme song and original music were composed by Ian Koss, with additional music by Blue Dot Sessions and Sam Johnson. 
Threatened is a production of Bird Note and overseen by content director Allison Wilson. Huge thanks to the whole Bird Note team for their work on this season. You can find a transcript of this show and additional resources, Bird Note's other podcasts, and much more at birdnote.org. Thanks for listening. See you next time. <laughs>